Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As Jesus stepped out of the land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times he had seized him. He was kept in guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion. For many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the men and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swineherds saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man with whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told how the one who had possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gesserides asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. of the story 
again this morning. The story of the demoniac in Luke chapter 8 has parallels in the Gospels of Mark and Matthew that fill in some of the picture that we have of this man. As a demoniac, which means to be plagued by demons, here those demons are referred to by the name Legion, which for anyone in first century Rome immediately connotes a reference to the Roman military occupation of that time. But it also perhaps lays uh, a reference to the man's occupation by these demons and by his community. He plays a certain role, if you will. He's the jester, the expendable, but a clever one whose place in that role is reinforced both by the patterns of his unhealth, but also by the projections of his community. On the one hand, we think that they would want to be rid of such a man. Like some cities try to buy a bus ticket for the homeless or the mentally ill to get them to another city, someone else's problem. But we see that they need someone in this role. It says right there in the story that they shackle him. They bind him to themselves. And that when he is overtaken by the demon, he breaks out into the wilds. Only for them to shackle him again. Binding him to themselves. This role, known in history, has been come to be called the role of the scapegoat. The role of the scapegoat. And if there is anything to a sort of original communal sin in our tradition, it is this scapegoat. It happens right there in the creation story. Recall that when God comes looking for Adam and Eve after they have eaten, uh, eaten the forbidden fruit, that, that Adam blames Eve, and Eve blames the serpent. Thereby, Adam and Eve having something in common to be able to live in the tension of having violated God's command, blaming the serpent as the scapegoat. And if you notice, we do it too. The problem is, at best, we don't tend to notice. And at worst, we are more formed by the poison political crap that we see on our television sets and on Facebook and on any kind of media. A political narrative built and based in scapegoating that comes in spades in our society. We're more warned by that than by the gospel we see today's story foreshadowing for us. Where in the cross, it will be revealed that scapegoating is a futile attempt at holding a community together. It's futile before the purposes of salvation in Christ. Like the husband in the joke, we don't hear the wife's response. And I'm not sure, particularly as a society, that we're even moving closer to try to hear. When I say we, I, I, of course, I implicate myself, but I mean we are our human family, not even trying to hear one another, instead just trying to point out how deaf the other person is, and not always willing to recognize or acknowledge how deaf we can be. And I think sometimes the deaf hear better than all of us. This story reveals a pattern to us, the pattern of an ostracized and convenient scapegoat for this Gentile town of Gerasa. And a figure in Jesus who stands in the face of such futile attempts to hold community together, offering something of a total reconciliation and healing, a different story, a different way by which to live. 
Yes, there is the healing of the man who is now clothed and of full mind. But the missed healing is that of the town, of the community. In the great reversal here from earlier in Luke's gospel where after his teaching, Jesus is pushed onto the edge of a cliff. And it says the crowds are pressing in on him and would throw him over a cliff. In a great reversal, here instead, it is the demoniac, not the demoniac being thrown off the cliff, but the powers that hold the demoniac down. The representation of this demon scatters frantically when its power enters a non-communitive, non-socially intelligent, and yes, historically, for the Jews, a pejorative choice, the pig herd. And so there's panic, and they're scattering, and they throw themselves off the cliff in a dislocation not of the scapegoat, but of the system and the powers that held the scapegoat captive. Now, if you're following me at all, this is kind of a big deal. I mean, Jesus is doing something much more than a simple hearing here. We can't go, Jesus! Wow! But here's the thing. The system didn't change because one person was healed. They didn't welcome the transformed way of living. They didn't like the change he was offering. They didn't like the demoniac healed, fully clothed, and of right mind. Unlike other places in the gospel, they didn't ask Jesus to begin healing more of their people. Instead, they told him to leave. They held on to what was left of their scapegoating narrative. And what we know begins with fear, if Jesus stays with them, would rise up into anger, and they would turn Jesus into their next scapegoat. So they ask him to leave, probably so that they can rebuild their community around the experience they had with Jesus. Now what's interesting is that this healed Gerizim demoniac this healed man, fully clothed and upright mind, asks to follow Jesus back to where Jesus is going. But Jesus doesn't let him do that. Instead, Jesus will send this healed person back immediately into this community to proclaim his transformation, to tell them what God has done for him. We'll come back to that. Long before Jefferson pens the Declaration of Independence, Lincoln the Emancipation Proclamation, or we, as we observed this past week, Juneteenth, June the 19th, 1865, which represented the final realization of abolition, of abolition in Galveston, Texas, after the war. Far before Susan B. Anthony or Elizabeth Cady Stanton fought for the vote, before Martin told us about his dream, before Harvey Milk announced his candidacy for the Board of Supervisors, long before any of that, we have this little kernel in our scripture today, in the letter to the Galatians. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer a Jew or a Greek slave or free, male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Whoa! Some 17, 1800, almost 2,000 years before some of the ideas that we consider to be profound for our understanding as human beings, we hear Paul writing this of the gospel. This, this huge deal in how we think about our lives. But again, only if we're 
close enough to Jesus to hear it being spoken to us. Or, if we haven't really heard it or internalized it yet, only if we're coming closer to Him to try to hear it, even when we would whether be proving that such words are deaf to reality. I lament that while the opening joke portrays a sort of ironic death following the death kind of image, that we, and here I mean myself and you in this room, but our society, our human family, are being formed more by the system of scapegoating than by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm careful here not to scapegoat the scapegoating, if you follow. For what Christ reveals on the cross is the futility of such efforts. We will not build a community by scapegoating people who scapegoat. We can all be one only in Christ or only in the realization that dying to self, we are no longer those things by which we separate and distinguish ourselves, are no longer those things by which we violate and at our worst commit violence against ourselves. And when I say that, when I speak of my lament, I mean to guess that like me, many of you don't like a long sermon. But the truth is, is by this evening, you will have connected with more than 15 or 20 minutes, most of us, of some sort of malign political poison on your television sets or new media. By this evening, hours each week, we drink of this stuff. Hours, maybe even every day. These things that propagate an antithesis of the gospel for me. They encourage the scapegoating of whomever we don't like. This week on Juneteenth, the holiday I mentioned earlier, June 19th, the Right Reverend Eugene Sutton, Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Maryland, testified at a joint a committee hearing in the House on Reparations. In part of his remarks, he said, to which I will borrow here as my foundation, to quote, some of my friends are for Republicans, some of my friends are for Democrats, and as a religious leader, I am for my friends. He goes on to reflect on the consideration of reparations words simply needing to repair. As the work that begins with the awareness of the unwitting death, the awareness of the husband in our joke, that reconciliation is born of our own brave work to awaken to a system that while wearing a different mask than slavery, still scapegoats the person of color, women, white men, or increasingly again, as we seem to do in America every couple of generations, the immigrant. Are we moving closer to try to hear? Or are we shackling ourselves in tombs called echo chambers? Later that afternoon, I saw a segment on Tucker Carlson's opinion show on the Fox Network. Carlson, as some of you know, is a member of the Episcopal Church. He attends the Episcopal Church. And the reason I'm telling you about this is because he brought Bishop Sutton onto his show for a conversation. Bishop Sutton speaks in the opening of the segment to a recent resolution unanimously passed in his diocese uh, at a convention to address the issue of reconciliation and reparations within their diocese and borders. Now, watching this, of course, remembering the medium, the goal of, of Carlson to 
you know, get ratings. That's the, that's the, 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 the goal. Carlson offers this headline-grabbing idea to the bishop of the reparations being the diocese giving all of their endowed assets to black people in their diocese and churches. That's what he offers the bishop. Interestingly, the bishop doesn't take it off the table, but he does try to return to his spiritual teaching, as a bishop does and ought to do, from the hearing. And this is where my brother Carlson errs in a way that I want to redress. Not so that you think I'm scapegoating Carlson, but because he's my brother in Christ and a fellow of the Episcopalian. Because I seek repair, reparations with him in relationship. Carlson begins to make the argument that, that he shouldn't and he doesn't feel guilty because he hasn't enslaved him. Here's the thing. Reparations are not about how any one of us participated in or not in slavery. This isn't about, as Carlson rightly points out, us bearing the sins of our father or our grandfather. While it is plainly the case of history that slavery continued long after Reconstruction, by another name, into the lifetimes of many of the Congress men and women present in that hearing, it isn't about feeling guilty for that either. Instead, the Christian gospel calls us to, and tells us what it's about. It's, it's what Jesus offers the town here in the story today. It's about taking responsibility for what is before us right here and right now. Not ruled by history, but not ignorant of it either. It is the responsibility to try to hear, to move closer, even when we feel sometimes like all we're trying to do is to be heard. It is us being okay with the demoniac being fully clothed and of right mind. Because upon reading and rereading this story, perhaps we come to realize that we have become and been the demoniac all along. We start with the realization that, that we have been bound by a narrative that keeps us from realizing all are one in Christ. We have work to do to realize this for every human being. For those who believe in a kingdom of heaven united with our earth in a new creation, as the scripture tells us. It's just like y'all have a good habit of doing here at St. Patrick's, arriving 15 minutes early and picking up a friend on the way in, on the way with you. That's the Christianity we preach. The kingdom of heaven and earth united in a new creation is something that began with Christ. It's something that began with that statement in the letter to the Galatians. It's something that is a reality for us here and now. It is a narrative that we can arrive to and bring others with us. You see, what Carlson got wrong is that Christianity isn't just about you and me as individuals before God, justified or unjustified. But rather, it's about the real and personal, personal commitment of faith in becoming a part of a body that is wounded and seeking healing. Not through the making over or covering up of old wounds, but by thrusting our hand out like Thomas, trusting that in the wounds of Christ and our body, the church, we are reconciled, not in spite of our wounds, but inclusive of the redemptive work of Christ by his justification, by Jesus' faith, his death, his life. Thank you,
us have been baptized. We have been clothed in Christ. So that there is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, but that we are all one in Christ Jesus. Are we like the Gerasenes? We want to send Jesus away when we hear such things. Or can we, now just speaking to us here in the room, draw a little closer today, me included, to the good grace of hearing God's word? And if so, and I said I'd come back to this, and if so, it we have heard these words. For those of us who have heard and been healed, Jesus sends you, the healed person, back into your community, back into the society, back into the world, back with Tucker Carlson and with Bishop Sutton and with others to proclaim your transformation and to tell them what God has done for you so that we can flush out this poison of scapegoating and learn to love and witness that there is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, but that fully clothed in Christ and fully in the mind of Christ, we are reconciled as one. That is what it is worth listening to a 25-minute sermon for. is what it is spending your whole life working on is worth it for. So to those of you, to those of us who have heard, our call is to be brave, to be peacemakers, to be reconcilers, to help others hear by God's good grace this good news of salvation, this good news of that is worth our time, worth our very lives. Thanks be to God.